Okay, here we go. We got uh, an exciting topic for this video. We're gonna now investigate the delta octahedral values, the splitting diagram in correlation to an actual energy value associated with the complex. Now, since most of these transition metal ions can dissolve in water, we can actually create a table, a table that you can see right here that shows you the energy, the delta octahedral energy associated with making the hexa aqua complex for each one of these metal ions. And once again, the superscript number right here represents the charge of the metal. So if you're dealing with vanadium 2 plus, the delta octahedral value is 12,000 inverse centimeters. If you're dealing with manganese 3 plus, then the delta octahedral value is 21,000 inverse centimeters. Okay, so these are the wave numbers. Um, and so we can actually have a table of correlation in association with water being the only ligand present on the metal center. And you might say, well, that's kind of cool, but you know, that's not the only ligand that we know of, but it is a reference value. And as such, we're gonna use that reference value to do some calculations. All right, so these are all your two plus ions, right? Which I'm highlighting here. Um, now, generally speaking, uh, a few things that I need to say before I move on to the next part is that the energy of the crystal field splitting actually increases with charge. And you can kind of see that here. If you look at the two plus state compared to the three plus state, the three plus state is higher in energy. And the same thing is true in every single situation that you observe right here. Manganese two plus is lowering energy than manganese three plus, which itself is lowering energy than manganese four plus, right? So as the charge increases, the delta of the hydrogen uh, splitting diagram increases, the energy increases. And the reason why is because as the charge gets larger, more positive, the ligands are attracted even more strongly to the metal, uh, creating a shorter, shorter bond and making the repulsive interaction with the d orbitals even stronger. So that creates a larger gap in the uridelta octahedral values. Um, now, another thing to notice too is that some of the values here, the 8,000 inverse centimeters, this actually doesn't even fall in the visible spectrum. This is, um, you know, low enough that it's actually technically in the infrared spectrum and we don't get to see those colors. Uh, that's invisible to our eyes. We have machines, of course, that can definitely detect infrared light, UV light, etc., etc., in addition to visible. So that's how we can actually detect them. But you wouldn't be able to see much of a color. Now, the other thing to also be said is that the second and third row transition metals, so technically this is the second row transition metals, third row transition metals, compared to their first row transition metal analogs, the values of the octahedral tend to be larger in general. And this has to do a lot with the fact that the orbitals, the d orbitals for the second row and third row transition metals, are not as diffused away um, from the metal as you can, you know, you tend to have with the first transition metals um, in general. Now, specifically, one problem that the first row transition metals have is that the radial extension of those d orbitals doesn't go as far out as the 4s orbitals, and so they're kind of, to some degree, buried a little bit compared to the d orbitals of the second row and third row so you actually get to make much better bonds with these orbitals and as a result you tend to make much better catalysts not always but usually with the second and third row transition metals um, and you know within the context of delta of the hydro splittings you have higher energy values because you make better stronger bonds with them all right now we have water as the reference compound but we can have any other type of ligand. And as long as you have this um, complex in which all six ligands are the same, we refer to those as homoleptic complexes, um, you basically can take the reference value of the hexa aqua complex and tweak it to kind of recalibrate it for the ligands that you have instead. So if you were to have, for instance, a bromide ligand, so you have the hexa bromo complex as opposed to the hexa aqua complex, you can recalibrate the value of the hexa aqua complex with this f factor of 0.72 or if you have six a side 
or acyl complexes, excuse me, acyl ligands around the metal center, then you will recalibrate the aqua delta octahedral value with a value of 0.83. Um, now, the value, some of these ligands, as you can see, have a value, an F factor value less than 1 in respect to water, and other ones have values higher than those of water. We refer to the ligands here that have an F factor less than one as the weak field ligands. And the ones here that have a higher value than that of water, we refer to them as the strong field ligands. And water itself is considered a weak field ligand. So we will actually include it in the table here on the left side. Okay, so those are your weak field ligands. They actually decrease the delta octahedral energy separation. That's why we call them weak. The strong field ligands here, uh, not including water, um, actually increase the separation in energy from the lower and upper energy levels of the crystal field diagram. And mathematically speaking, the delta octahedral value of your hexa complex, you know, depending on what the ligand is, can simply be determined by multiplying the F factor of that ligand with the G ion value that we found for the hexa aqua complex, the reference value. So this is how we recal recalibrate the delta octahedral for any complex we want. So for instance, let's say that we have manganese uh, with six amine ligands around it. The charge of this complex is two plus. Since the amines have no charge of their own, the charge of this complex is the charge of the metal. So now we know that manganese is two plus. If we look at the table here, Manganese 2 plus is the value that we see here of 8,000, right? So manganese 2 plus has 8,000 inverse centimeters as the delta octahedral value for the hexa aqua complex. Um, and because we're dealing with amine ligands, well, we're dealing with an F factor of 1.25. So multiply the 1.25 by the 8,000 that is in this table. And this will give you a value of 10,000 inverse centimeters, which is the delta octahedral of the hexaamine uh, manganese 2 plus complex. Um, okay, so pretty much the idea, as I was implying before, is that when you have your metal complexes, right? Now, in the case of manganese, this is kind of important to be said, but this is actually important for other ones as well. Um, if you have three electrons only, it doesn't matter whether the separation is large or small in terms of the upper and lower energy levels. You will just have three electrons on the bottom portion, and that's the end of the story. But if you have more than that, the question becomes, well, do you place electrons on the top or do you pair them up? And this is where the ligands come into play. If the ligands are weak field ligands, generally speaking, what happens is that you're lowering the energy separation between the upper and lower portions, making it a little more likely for the electrons to first full, you know, fill up each individual orbital. But if you use strong field ligands, you end up making the separation larger. Uh, and at some point, it becomes less likely that the electrons will want to go up to these levels because energy-wise, that's going to be you know, a worse off situation than if you pair them up. Uh, so 5 ampere electrons yeah, for manganese versus 1 ampere electrons. So this is uh, a big difference, right? The more ampere electrons you have, the greater the magnetism of the complex can be, right? So these 5 ampere electrons is kind of what you want to have, as opposed to 1 ampere electron if you're looking for magnetic, you know, good magnetic properties. All right, now another way to refer to these situations is that because we have a lot more ampere electrons in this complex, where you have weak field ligands, we refer to the complex as being high spin. You have a lot of electrons with the same spin number. And over here, where you have the lowest amount of ampere electrons, we call this the low spin complex. All right, now, um, yeah, both cases give you a paramagnetic complex in this example. Uh, but now, the reference value that I'm going to give you, and this is very rough, by the way, but as a reference value, if you are above 13,000 inverse centimeters for your value of delta octahedral, you can consider your complex um, a strong field or low spin. If, on the other hand, the value of delta octahedral is below 13,000, you are probably dealing with a weak field 
complex or a high spin complex. Okay, so that's how you're gonna. This is a rough estimate, but 13,000 is usually where I, you know, assess my cutoff for low spin and high spin. All right, so as I was saying before, delta octahedral is gonna increase with the charges, right? The higher the charge, the higher the delta octahedral. And so what this means is that low spin complexes, the ones that have the highest separation between the lower and upper energy levels, um, are going to be observed more often with metals that have a 3 plus oxidation state or higher. To some degree, the ligand itself might make a difference, but you know, having this higher charge will already make the separation so large that the ligand may not necessarily counteract that effect. Right, and you can kind of see that for the complexes right here, titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, they are above 13,000, making them low spin. Second, entero transition metals, um, they basically have values that are already high and, and in terms of the octahedral, and as a result, they are low spin. So that's something that I kind of want you to be aware of. Um, your third row and second row transition metals are technically going to be low spin, almost guaranteed, especially if you have a 3 plus um, oxidation state. Okay, so just to kind of give you an idea of, you know, why I'm kind of expressing that um, idea that your second and third row transition metals, you know, may end up being uh, low spin, irrespective of the ligand present. Let's take a look at ruthenium. Let's look at ruthenium 2 plus, the one with the shortest or um, smallest energy gap. Okay, 20,000 in this case. If we use iodine, which is even lower than bromide, so I'm going to estimate that value as being 0 0.70, roughly speaking. If we multiply 20,000, which is the G ion value for the hexa aqua complex reference value, multiply by 0 0.70, which I'm approximating a little bit for iodine since it's not given in the table. Um, Multiplying those two values gives us a value of 14,000. And even though we're using one of the weakest ligands in the series with the uh, lowest charge for ruthenium that we can get, um, even then we still get a complex that technically speaking can be classified as being uh, low spin or um, that will have the least amount of ampere electrons. So you can see here that just being on the second row or third row of the transition metals just because of that, you end up having, generally speaking, a low spin complex. But in the future, what I'm really going to want you to do is to perform this calculation, F times G ion, to see what this value is. Below 13,000, high spin. Above 13,000, low spin. All right. Now, uh, for iron, I'm going to show you another example here. Uh, for iron, you know, same idea, 14,000. If you actually use a weak enough ligand, you could actually turn that 14,000 down to 13,000 or below 13,000, making the complex high spin. So for the first row transition metals, having the weak field versus strong field ligand matters the most. Your second and third row transition metals are going to be almost locked with a low spin situation. But do the calculation and you know compare the number to the cutoff to make your judgment call. All right, in the next video, I'm going to talk about the tetrahedral complexes and the square planar complexes. So for now, this is it for this video. So see you on the next one.